Okay, I guess uh, I think we should start. Well, good evening, uh, ladies and gentlemen. It's really great to see so many people today. Uh, I must confess that uh, uh, our IPM president, uh, uh, Stephen O'Connor, was slightly concerned at the beginning about how many people we'll get. And I remember when we started the event uh, organization, I think, do not worry, we will fill the room. And we're nearly there. So it's, uh, it's a great, great pleasure to see you all at King's. Uh, I'm Professor Seb Orselin. I'm the head of school of biomedical engineering and um, um, imaging sciences. Um, and uh, I have the honor today to actually be uh, your uh, person doing the opening remarks. Um, I will first uh, mention to everyone in this room that uh, you're getting filmed right now, uh, but from the back. So uh, we are not breaching uh, GDPR in any way or shape or form. If you get concerned about this, you still have time to walk away from this place because we're going to film the entire set of event. But I've been told it will be only crowds and speakers already sign up. Uh, so we should be fine. Uh, we're quite strict on time of time. Or we've been told uh, that we need to uh, basically end up uh, to the reception to cross the road at 8 p.m. Uh, so we will have quite limited time for questions. Uh, we will try to make sure that uh, after every single speaker, we have a few minutes for you to actually ask questions. But we'll try to make the um, um, uh, event of the panel discussion as um, more entertaining as possible. And therefore, we really hope that uh, you will uh, ask questions, or at least um, you will make a, um, uh, a few uh, statements uh, if you disagree with some of the response of the panel members. Um, today, really, it's, it's all about uh, demonstrating that IPEN is really working uh, at the forefront of some of those new digital health activity, and is doing it in close partnership uh, with the university and uh, Acute NHS Trust. And it's a great privilege for, for Kings to be a, a partner in this event uh, with IPEM, uh, but as well uh, jointly uh, with guys in St. Thomas Hospital, uh, where um, um, our colleagues um, and friend um, uh, Steve Kivel is heading the Department of uh, Medical Physics there. Um, so uh, today we have great uh, speakers, three uh, great speakers, uh, um, trying to basically present you three different kind of level of granularity in uh, artificial intelligence from a very, I would say, um, large horizon overview uh, at the level of an industry um, presentation uh, about how AI is currently changing and transforming life, hopefully for the better and not making everyone unemployed. Um, and the second talk will be um, uh, from our chief technology officer and senior lecturer in artificial intelligence, uh, Dr. Uh, George Cardoso, uh, who is going to focus much more on how AI is applied currently in medical physics. And then we will have an end um, a talk um, from um, uh, Dr. James Theo, who is clinical director of data science and consultant neurologist at King's College Hospital, about how um, data analytics and AI is really making a difference in real world NHS trust environment, especially certainly um, with a focus on neurology, I guess. Uh, so a great privilege to me uh, to introduce now um, Johnny Hancock, senior data scientist at NVIDIA. Um, I've been uh, knowing Jeremy, uh, Journey for a few years, and he's actually spending time physically uh, within King's um, every week and spending time with our researchers and our clinicians. He's passionate about healthcare um, and its applications um, in the domain of artificial intelligence, has been working in many different areas, quite often related to automation and imaging, um, with a strong angle around the public sector and the NHS. Uh, Johnny, please come and give your presentation. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. Um, it's very nice to be here. It's, um, it's always nice to spend a bit of time at, at King's. Um, uh, so I've been working in artificial intelligence uh, at NVIDIA for about, probably about 18 months. And prior to that, um, I worked in the health and life sciences department at, at Intel, doing quite a sort of similar role, which is all about helping people with, with technology, trying to get the sort of most out of their technology. Um, so, this is going to be quite a sort of high level introduction, as Seb mentioned, a nice gentle uh, sort of prod into um, artificial intelligence and just sort of looking back a little bit at, at its uh, inception. So what do we mean by artificial intelligence? What is AI? Um, AI is unfortunately a very sort of overloaded term. It has all sorts of connotations uh, to sort of science fiction, um, things like HAL, 
so it's, it's not the most helpful term necessarily to get the sort of public's uh, support for, for, you know, machine learning and deep learning. It's slightly unfortunate. But, um, I mean, you know, AI we, has been through several kind of iterations and we, people often think that this is a new thing. And, of course, it isn't. Um, you know, John McCarthy coined the term artificial intelligence in the, in the 1950s. Um, and this picture here is actually uh, Frank Rosenblatt, who uh, was, uh, he's actually uh, wiring together the connections for a perceptron. So perceptron is, is still really the fundamental unit of, of neural networks today. Um, at the time, they thought that the New York Times reported that this work would, would most likely lead to... Um, uh, sentient robots that could do all sorts of you know, human-like things and, and even um, reproduce themselves. I think they're a little bit premature on that, that prediction. But, um, and in fact, there have been several kind of you know, AI summers and winters uh, since then. But it is interesting that um, you know, the fundamental principles have not changed since, since then. What has changed is the complexity um, and the sort of computing power that we can apply to these techniques. So we like to think of artificial intelligence as, as a sort of, you know, this, this, this layered sort of uh, domain in which uh, there are a number of different approaches. So when artificial intelligence was first kind of coined, we were using it for sort of problem solving of, you know, things like kind of chess games. And they were really using kind of logic, just kind of basic logic reasoning systems um, but unfortunately, that didn't really provide particularly kind of human-like behaviour. Um, the next era really came with machine learning, which was pioneered for a number of things. But um, one of the sort of canonical examples probably is the sort of email spam filter um, using this kind of bag of words approach where you were basically trying to separate all the incoming um, emails as sort of good or bad or uh, benign or bad, I suppose. Um, using the keywords that are in there uh, and using these kind of machine learning techniques which kind of learn from the data that they're presented with. Now, um, deep learning is kind of the latest uh, flavour of kind of machine learning and artificial intelligence. It builds on those same capabilities. It, it, it still has this, you know, uh, ability to kind of learn from the data that it's presented with. And it's been responsible for some fairly... Um, impressive kind of breakthroughs over the last last few years. So, you know, just looking at some of the things that, that the capabilities that have emerged. I mean, you know, we've been able to play chess quite quite successfully using computers for a while. But you know, these this is like the sort of kind of superhuman performance. So, um, things like uh, Go was always considered uh, a game that was just too kind of sophisticated for computers. And actually, approaches like deep reinforcement learning have, have proved that this is not so. Um, and as we're starting to see, um, there are a lot of other sort of more useful tasks than just playing games to do with kind of medicine um, that, uh, that have been kind of not solved, but have achieved this kind of, you know, on a par with, with, with human performance. And as a data scientist, the, the, the one thing which really spurred a lot of this on was, was ImageNet, which is kind of nestling in the middle there. So in 2012, the first kind of deep learning convolutional neural network approach was applied to this uh, ImageNet challenge of, of classifying internet images. Um, and people really took notice of the uh, performance that year from Alex Krzyzewski uh, because his... Uh, like I say, sort of deep learning based network beat all the, the previous approaches that had been sort of honed by kind of humans using kind of domain expertise to, to, to get their success. And this one just learnt from the data. It didn't use any you know, prior sort of human knowledge. People really took notice and they adopted this technique. And obviously, um, you know, the results have probably been obvious to, to, to many of us working in the field and um, everybody really because these approaches are really kind of changing the way that uh, we go about our sort of daily lives um, so this deep learning method as I sort of touched upon previously people doing kind of computer science PhDs would spend a lot of their time sort of figuring out features that they could 
uh, code around to tell the computer to recognize objects. So, you know, you might have created a sort of um, an ellipsoid detector that would perhaps, you know, detect sort of wheels or something. Now, deep learning doesn't do this. It, it uses this kind of this model. It's basically just a whole load of sort of connected weights. And as you show it the data, um, the incoming data, which would be sort of images, which may or may not be of cars, um, and you, you associate those images with a label that is what it learns from. So the label just says what the object is, whether it's a car or something else. Um, and you iterate over this process through many epochs. Eventually, the network learns to be able to, to sort of predict new images that it hasn't seen. Um, and like I said, the novelty is that it doesn't use any of these handcrafted features. It learns the features itself, um, uh, which you know, really kind of takes the human expert out of the loop. Um, and this has been very transformative, as you can imagine, uh, because we just need a lot of data and a lot of compute power um, now to be able to do what took you know, many years of kind of expert uh, iterations previously. So, so typically now we will train a, net, a neural network, we'll use a, a training data set, like I say, which would be comprised of labels and example images for, for a, an image classification or segmentation uh, problem. And after training through many epochs, which is a sort of a full run through your training set, you basically got this trained model. And we can then do other things with it, like we can sort of fuse some of the layers together. We can uh, you know, squish it down into its sort of neatest and smallest memory footprint, footprint representation. And we can then deploy that. So we can deploy it to you know, medical devices, uh, to, you know, to the edge, to autonomous vehicles, whatever it might be that, that, you know, where we need to do some kind of real-time inference, as we call it. So the inference is actually the you know, a prediction on new data, and the training is the sort of preparing that model. Um, so there are so many examples of this going on. I mean, you know, the internet pioneers like you know, Facebook and Google obviously have been doing this stuff for a lot of years now. You know, Facebook, um, whenever a new uh, image is uploaded, it can detect with about sort of 97, 98% accuracy, and maybe a bit out of date now as well, it's probably higher, um, you, you know, it can recognize your face if you've got a uh, you know, Facebook account, if it knows of you. Uh, and that is you know, a very impressive sort of error rate. It's kind of on a par, really, again, with human recognition. Um, also, things like you know, natural language processing. So there are about sort of, uh, Google offers about, I think it's about 40 different um, you know, language translations and some of them are, are, are really kind of impressive. I mean, I think the Chinese uh, language uh, accuracy now is pretty much on a par with, with kind of human translation, which is, which is you know, amazing. And of course, you know, not forgetting things like our iPhone, um, about a fifth of all searches now are done using speech. So, you know, we're able to, to, to use our, um, uh, you know, use our voices to control our, our computing, uh, which is quite, quite an achievement because, you know, it wasn't really that long ago that uh, voice recognition was really not very effective. But of course, you know, things like Alexa and Siri and Cortana um, are, are amazingly kind of accurate and they can deal with background noise, they can deal with um, you know, different voices. So um, really what we're looking at now is this kind of new era. We've been through this kind of PC internet um, era in sort of 1990s, uh, you know, really driven by, by sort of you know, likes of Intel and um, Microsoft uh, and, and Yahoo of course and Netscape. Uh, and then we moved to this kind of mobile cloud um, situation where, you know, previously about a billion people connected, um, you know, being able to use this kind of computing infrastructure. With mobile, that moved to about two and a half billion. Um, and of course, with, with artificial intelligence and the Internet of Things, you know, that is only going to grow to sort of hundreds of billions of devices. Um, and this is the area, the era, of course, we are faced with now. Um, so one of the kind of many uh, things that, that uh, NVIDIA are, are doing is, is looking at how this sort of, you know, this, this, this full kind of landscape from edge, device, edge devices um, with their kind of sensors and with the data they're generating, 
can upload some of that data to the cloud for, for training networks, um, can do inference on the edge as well, so on the device that's actually collecting that data. Um, and we're, so NVIDIA have been developing platforms which uh, can do and manage things like this. So NVIDIA EGX, for example, is a system that um, will sort of manage the deployment of your models to the edge, the inference part. Um, and it will do that kind of, you know, trying to make a very efficient model because obviously resources are, are, are more scarce on the edge, so on your mobile device or your, you know, in your car than they are in the data center. And we also provide a lot of um, software, so, pl you know, platforms on which to do things like training um, for, for, for medicine and other domains. So what sort of impact is all this going to have on, on society? I mean, this is a, you know... Uh, a, a very sort of open question and as a data scientist I'm certainly not qualified to answer most of these um, questions but uh, you know obviously a lot of people talk about these things um, and there, there's some very sort of subtle kind of discussions to be had that uh, I'm not sure you've got answers to at the moment I mean for example the, the, along the top there, you've actually got uh, these four faces, very realistic-looking faces. Now, they've actually been generated by an artificial neural network, so they're not real people. Um, they, uh, that network was trained on a celebrity face data set. Um, and this is what it can do. It can generate these realistic images. Um, I was actually at a, a, a conference the other day, and... Um, one of the co-speakers who, who works for a security company was telling me that, that he'd actually come across the first um, voice, uh, artificial voice-generated scam. So somebody had uh, captured some audio footage of somebody's boss and got that voice <laughs> to, to ring him up and tell him to deposit some money <laughs> into a foreign account. And because it was his boss... You know, he didn't question it. And it, um, it's, it's quite kind of scary, this, this idea. Now, of course, you know, AI can be, is a tool and it can be used for good and bad. Um, but, I mean, it's a bit like the kind of spam filter we were talking about before. You know, you, however sophisticated the, the sort of malevolent part of AI is, hopefully there will be an equally um, impressive, if perhaps slightly better, <laughs> AI that is able to discern between what is, you know, fake and what is real. Um, but of course, it's you know, it's uh, as humans, it's quite difficult to do. And of course, there are things like the you know the implications on the workforce. Um, you know, there are all sorts of concerns about this. I mean, you know, I think certainly we're a long way from from anything sort of dramatic happening. I think you know, computers perhaps have got the ability to be able to take away some of the kind of drudgery from 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 many industries. But um, you know, this kind of artificial general intelligence is still quite a long way off, most, most people seem to think. And, of course, there are things like, you know, legal implications and ethics as well. Um, you know, there aren't really any sort of robust <coughs> ethics frameworks out there that, that, you know, in the same way as perhaps there have been for um, uh, genomics. Uh, so, you know, who gets to decide what, what, what AI um, can be trained and, you know, what it should and shouldn't be used for? You know, these are questions that are very kind of open. <coughs> Um, I was talking with some, uh, a legal attorney the other day who was, who was saying that there's a, a test case going on at the moment because somebody's created an AI that can actually generate inventions. Um, so who owns the, the intellectual property from that, for that? Is it the AI? Is it the guy who created the AI? Is it the person who you know, picked up the print up from the computer that, that generated the invention? Some very interesting kind of questions being raised on this. So hopefully, and this is something which you know, um, George is going to talk a little bit about, one of the really obvious use cases, you know, really compelling use cases, is medicine. Um, you know, I'm sure you're all probably equally aware of the statistics that I am. We've got these real pressures on our NHS system, um, and we need a way to, to try and you know, alleviate some of the sort of bottlenecks in, 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 you know, in things like radiology and pathology. Um, and, and, you know, we hope that uh, some of these new technologies are going to be able to do exactly that. So, um, 
some great examples um, that, that George is going to show. Again, NVIDIA have been developing platforms for this, this sort of thing. You know, we've got this Clara platform that we're working with, um, with some of the KCL guys with as well. Um, and um, there are also things like, you know, kind of drug discovery as well. So, you know, it's, it's more than just the kind of image side, side of things. There are things like kind of simulations. So this particular slide is, is looking at a 4D simulation for, um, for modeling kind of the way that proteins might um, uh, interact with, with neurons. Um, so, you know, this is all about sort of developing new drug therapies for things like, you know, Alzheimer's and Parkinson's. Um, so we really hope that this is going to be quite a sort of transformative um, use of AI in this, in this, this and many other domains. But um, you know, I'm very pleased to be working in the kind of health, health and life sciences sector. It's, it's, it's fascinating. Um, and of course, you know, it's, it, it, we really have got the opportunity to do some, so do some good for society with this. So that's everything that I had to say. Um, happy to take any questions if we've got time. Indeed. We've got time for a couple of questions. Mark. Thank you very much. That was fantastic. So you mentioned earlier on about winters. Are we in a permanent summer now? <laughs> well, um, I'm sure NVIDIA would like to think that we are. Um, I, I think inevitably these things are going to sort of, you know, wax and wane to a certain extent. And, you know, I don't, I don't, you know, I don't believe for an instant that um, things are going to, it's going to be a permanent summer. I think there will be... Um, there will be new innovations and innovations will come and go. And we're, I mean, you know, the thing is that I don't think deep learning and AI is going to go away. I think that that's for sure. It's definitely here to stay. But it's, you know, it's a very sort of broad domain now. And some, some techniques will certainly come and go and then others will kind of evolve and succeed. But um, I don't see any sign of uh, it, it abating. <laughs> Got time for one more question. Any um, guesses of where we'll be in five years' time? Oh, uh, <laughs> um, I think probably the short answer would be no. <laughs> the longer answer would be that, you know, I really hope that, that, particularly in medicine, I think it's a really difficult thing for us to make the sort of transition from the, the sort of research domain into having systems that are kind of clinically effective, clinically proven for all sorts of reasons. And I would really like to think that the work that KCL and, and partners are doing is going to help to make that transition uh, because it's not an easy uh, process at all, you know, and it's not, it's not just a technology problem. It's a sort of people and process and, you know, regulation. Regulate people. Probably. Yes. So, but hopefully if we all work together on that, then we'll get to this point where you know, society has faith that AI can actually really work well in medicine. Lovely. Thank you very much. We must move on. I'm sorry. Thank you very much. So I'd uh, like to introduce um, Jörg Cardosa, who is going to uh, give us a talk about AI in healthcare. Jörg is a senior lecturer at King's in London. Um, he's the Chief Technical Officer of the new Innovate UK funded Medical Imaging and AI Centre for Value Based Healthcare. So, um, AI in healthcare, thanks, you. Okay, excellent. Um, so, next slide. So, just to continue on what Johnny was saying before. Um, we really need to think about uh, healthcare um, and the current processes that exist in evidence-based medicine. So what, what currently happens in evidence-based medicine is that you have a pipeline where there's some data, then there's some information that is extracted from that data, and then there's a prediction that is made. Uh, and that prediction can or cannot be used clinically depending on how it's set up. And if you think about it, um, evidence-based medicine has really explored this to the limit and is currently accepted as the de facto way to do medicine. So you would have, for example, uh, a certain sample of, uh, of PSA, uh, and there's a decision that was made by looking into large amounts of data that this specific marker, uh, it could be low, medium, or high, and depending on this, uh, you would have an associated Gleason score, and depending on this Gleason score, you might or might not have, for example, prostate cancer. 
This is a very simple binary decision tree that is currently standard in uh, most uh, first world countries. And what was happened was, uh, throughout the last few years, was that we realized that uh, this pipeline was really inefficient. That some of the models that we were using, these really simplistic decision trees, were really not appropriate for some of the complex decisions we were making. Because there is a huge amount of interaction that goes beyond just a yes or no, or above or below a certain number. So what happened was, we said, oh, computers are really good at fitting models. They're really good at computing stuff. So let's relegate this prediction part to the computers. This is where uh, machine learning really, standard, really started. So in this uh, land before time, um, which is actually more than five years ago, um, what people used to do was to take a bunch of data, uh, extract some uh, features of some form. Uh, these would represent some information that we believe as humans to be relevant on that data, put them through an algorithm, such as a support vector machine, the random forest. They're just more complicated statistical models than the one we used to use in classic evidence-based medicine. And you'd make a prediction at the end. Um, and when we did this, we started, we again looked at the pipeline and we said, OK, we have these features that we uh, hand engineer. We decide what to do, what to give to the algorithm. And then the algorithm does its thing. Um, but much more interesting than that is kind of the next step, where we realize, actually, Humans are terrible at figuring out what we should be using inside of these algorithms. So the next step was kind of saying, let's expand this a little bit further and, and, and give the computers the freedom to choose their own features. We're just going to give them all of the data we have, in this case, images or some part of the patient healthcare record, and the computers by themselves are going to learn a, what is called a representation that is relevant for the problem that they're trying to solve, and they're going to be doing this by themselves. And here enters deep learning. So really, the, the, key, uh, the key transformation that happened when deep learning came in was really this idea of representation learning, this idea that we can take data, learn a representation, which you can think about as just a set of features that might not necessarily be human interpretable. They could be. Uh, but they are optimal for the task we want to solve. And now that we put these two things together, now we have really good algorithms to make predictions that can be well calibrated for risk and et cetera. And the three things that changed was the idea of representation learning, the fact that our software tools became much, much better. We could build these very complex networks by using things like auto differentiation and symbolic manipulation so that algorithms can do a lot of the calculations by themselves. And lastly, the amount of data has been exploding. Obviously, <coughs> hospitals have now been digital, some of them, since the late 90s, and data is exploding. And because of that, we are in a position where we have enough data that is of good quality enough to learn robust representations. So what can we do now? Um, and the interesting thing about deep learning is that the machinery is pretty much the same. It's just a bunch of building blocks, very, very simple functions, such as exponential functions and uh, rectifier units and uh, convolution operators. They're really, really simple mathematical functions that we compose one on another. And just by putting inputs and outputs inside of this composition of mathematical functions and launching an optimization process, which normally runs on the GPU, and that's why we have companies like NVIDIA on board, uh, you can train these systems to optimize their parameters and make predictions that are optimal given some target loss function that we chose. And all of deep learning can be seen as just a composition of functions. That's pretty much all there is with some optimizers on top. And if we now say what we have as an input is a bunch of, for example, slices of an image, and what we have as an output is a diagnosis or a prognosis or an outcome, we can train the system in a completely end-to-end -end manner by giving it input images with no extra features on top and saying, can you just update your own parameters so that you maximize the likelihood of making this prediction? The same exact system can be made, for example, hierarchical and applied to, um, to skin lesions, for example, where you might have different classifications of different types of lesions. And within each class, you might have subclasses and subclasses of these subclasses, which is actually how medicine is normally organized. We tend to compartmentalize pathologies in this kind of hierarchical structure. The same exact tools, um, but rather than making a single prediction for each input, we can make many, many predictions for each input. So we can have a prediction for each one of the pixels of an image. And if we can make a prediction per pixel, what we end up is with a pixel-wise label. So it tells you what is the content of that specific pixel. And we use this for many things. For example, self-driving cars use it to detect where the road is or the crosswalk or something like this. And in medicine, you would use it, for example, to localize organs or localize pathologies within the human body. So you see an example here where you have a brain that has been where the tumor 
component of the brain has been detected 100% automatically and validated against human raters that perform the same task. And now we achieve basically a performance that is very, very similar to human performance. And what's interesting about these systems is that they are really general purpose. So this was a challenge that we ran uh, last year where the purpose was to use a single machine learning algorithm to solve 10 completely different tasks in a way that it was 100% automated. So no human interaction, just the same algorithm on completely different tasks, given training, training data, and the algorithm had to learn that task. And what we demonstrated was, yes, actually, this is possible. And more than this, if you do it in a generalizable way, your algorithms will be state of the art. They'll be working in many situations as well as some of the best experts in the world, even though there's been no human interaction whatsoever to train this algorithm. This is 100% automated machine learning. And in the same way that you can predict a pixel label, as I was saying, from an input image, you can make the same kinds of predictions where you can predict, for example, a continuous value from an at every pixel from an image. For example, let's say that you're in a situation where you're trying to acquire um, a PET CT image. You would use the CT information to, co to correct for attenuation uh, the information coming from the PET. So the tracer gets attenuated, and because, or the, the emission gets attenuated. And because of that, we need to correct for that attenuation so that we can compensate for it, so that the image becomes realistic. If you put the patient through a PET um, MRI examination, the CT image is not available, and the CT image is what we need to be able to calculate this attenuation map. So what we can do is to say, if I give you an MR, can you predict what the CT image would have looked like if I had access to it, right? So you're predicting a CT image, a per pixel value of Hounsfield units in the CT from an input MRI. It's exactly the same model. It's just rather than predicting a label from an input, you predict an intensity from another input. And you can demonstrate that these models work really, really well. And more than that, they understand what we mean by anatomy. For example, this patient here had a little cyst inside of their skull. This was not part of the training set, and the model was able to pick that up and extrapolate. So it's not just memorizing examples. It's really trying to go a little bit beyond that and be able to extrapolate to new, new uh, applications. You can have other applications such as reconstruction, for example. Um, if you, when you acquire an MRI image, you're going to acquire this data in the case space domain, if you know uh, what the case space is. is uh, and what you can do is that you can run this inverse Fourier transform that gives you the image. However, if you only collect a subset of the data, so that is faster and you have less movement artifacts, the reconstructions can be really, really poor and your images do not look <coughs> good. So again, what you can do is to train an algorithm to just say, if I give you an image and I remove part of the information that I was acquiring, what would the original image would have looked like? So the system now becomes able to reconstruct this MRI information without ever seeing the full picture and being able to still provide a good quality solution to the problem. So this is important in MRI because it speeds up the examinations, but if you apply the same thing, for example, in CT, where you have radiation, you can then get the same quality of image using much less radiation because you're allowed to see less views or le the smaller sinogram or less resolution, which means you can do faster and lower those acquisitions for the same exact quality by teaching these models what human anatomy looks like. You can even go further and say, what if my patient had some metal implant somewhere? Can I learn to reconstruct the image as if the metal implant was never there? So rather than having these artifacts, these kind of striping artifacts that you see in this image there on the bottom left, uh, can we remove them by teaching a model to reconstruct an image as if this metal was not there? And again, this improves the quality of the image quite tremendously, and it allows the clinicians to then look at it in a different way. And because this is deep learning, we always need to go back to cats and dogs. That's kind of the, the principle of it. Um, so another way that to look at uh, images is to think about them as objects, right? Rather than saying, if we have an image of that cat, I'm going to label every pixel as being either cat or grass or something like that, if I have multiple elements in the picture, for example, multiple dogs and multiple cats, my cat label is meaningless because I want to count how many cats, for example. So what we want to do is to be able to detect these objects in images and we want to detect multiple objects that might be overlapping each other. This is really important in healthcare. And this is just a little video. I guess that gives you a bit of an insight. This is, might be a little bit too loud. I didn't realize yet the sound was on. <laughs> but bear with me for a second. Um, so what was the point of this? You could see that these systems are now working live on very complex video uh, with images coming from multiple systems without calibration. And they're becoming extremely robust even when you have multiple objects in the scene. The same exact algorithms 
mainly when transformed to 3D because most of medical images are three-dimensional objects, uh, can be made, for example, to classify uh, objects such as masses in mammography or, for example, hemorrhages or any kind of bleeding that exists in the brain of a, of a person. And this is exactly the same class of algorithms just applied to something different. <coughs> Another thing that you can do with these algorithms is to teach them about what human organs look like. For example, this is an algorithm that has learned what human brains look like. You can imagine and dream about brains and you can say, give me a brain. And it just gives you a random picture of a brain that does not exist, that does not belong to anyone. And the only thing you need to do is to give a bunch of examples of brains and it, uh, it learns what real brains need to look like and it learns to produce images that look like brains. So why do we want to do this? Is because if we teach these models to only learn about healthy brains, and we give them an unhealthy brain, the model is going to say, I have no idea what's happening here because I've never seen this before. You should look into it, which is basically a way to find abnormalities in images. It's a very, very simple thing to do, and it works surprisingly well. You can do something very similar to text. This is blurred on purpose. It's not a poor quality image. It's for uh, patient privacy reasons. But what you can do is you can take text uh, that was written about an image, for example, describing the contents of an image. Uh, you can clean it up if there's any things that you might not want. Uh, and then you can go through the same process of learning the contents of these texts. So you have an algorithm that just learns to represent content of text. And then you can plot it. You can say, for example, every single point here is a, a radiological examination of someone's brain. Uh, and we said, is there any relationship with age? So the colors here represent age. And you see that there are patterns related to age. Uh, and because I've been looking at this for way too long, uh, I can also tell you that there's these little clusters here that represent different pathologies. Uh, that are clustered around each other. So why am I also talking about text? It's because if you think about these two systems put together, where you have a system that knows how to generate images and understands images, and a system that knows how to generate text and understands text, what you can do is to basically just do a little shortcut there, where you say, I'm now going to give an image, and you learn about images, and I want to pass this information to this thing that now can generate text, and now you suddenly have a system that can generate text from the image. And this is what is called image captioning. And this has been used in several areas, for example, chest x-rays, and more recently, in the relatively low dimensional single slice uh, brain uh, imaging data, where you have systems that can understand the concept of images and concepts of text, and by mapping these two concepts to each other, can then do something even more uh, and even bigger. So just to finalize, I had this slide um, a few slides ago. And what we currently believe to be the next step is really uh, where uh, computers are taking over the full pipeline. So currently many of these systems require data to be extremely well curated uh, and, uh, and, and perfectly given to the algorithm so they can learn from them. So humans are still very much necessary to prepare the data. However, what we've been working on is really on systems that can take data from the patient healthcare record, from the picture, picture archiving system, from the radiological systems, from all of these different sources and try to harmonize how, how this data is collected try to have algorithms that automatically curate that data, that automatically quality control that data, to verify if there's different accessory sources of information that might be complementary. And by putting all this information together, by learning semantics from text, by understanding the meaning of certain things in that data, we can then have end-to-end -end learning systems that are uh, really able to extrapolate and be able to learn from all the rich data that currently exists in an hospital setting. And with that, I'll finish and I'll open the floor for questions. Thank you very much, George. Uh, have we got a couple of uh, questions from the audience? Just in the middle there. Yes. Yeah? Yes. Can the system tell you what features it's using? Uh, they can very much. So there's something called introspection or explainable deep learning where you can look at what is called uh, attention maps, which are blobs that point to the part of the image, for example, that has explained or that, uh, that is characteristic of the prediction you're making. That's one way. There's other way called deep dreaming. You might have seen the pictures uh, from Google with images that look very weird, that look like they're covered in cats and dogs. So those are algorithms that try to enhance the features, the things in the image, that made that prediction. So for example, if there's a cancer that is highly vascularized, and because of vascularization is the reason that the cancer is, I don't know, a glioblastoma, for example, you can enhance the vascularization feature so that the human can see that that was the thing that triggered the algorithm. So there's many ways to introspect these models and to try to make them safe. Yes? Uh, 
If these were to be used in routine clinical practice, have you any thoughts on how QA could be carried out yeah. in the um, hospital staff? So, so there's multiple components there um, to talk about. So depends on the class of the medical device. That's, that's part A. So you need to, first of all, define what the class of medical device is and what you need to do with it and what the degree of certification do you need. Uh, there is, there is a, a, de a dependence on the risk of that medical device. For example, if it's going to be used by a clinician as yet another source of information or if it's going to have a direct impact on patient care. And depending on many, many, many different variables, you'll have completely different processes that you need to go through. For many of these systems, they would act in a very similar way to any other type of a clinical trial that you'll run. For example, if you have a drug trial, you'll test it on an appropriate size, hold out prospective study, and by doing that validation, you'll demonstrate that the system is performing as designed. And obviously, after that happens, you still need to have things like post-market assessment, like happens in drugs, to be able to make sure that the performance of the algorithm remains moving forward. The processes of QAing these algorithms are not very well defined. Uh, there's actually current quite a lot of work happening in the UK. Actually, Harris is, is working on that with uh, his Topol Fellowship on defining what those processes would be, mainly for certain types of algorithms that evolve. But even for the ones that have fixed behavior, those don't have very strict QA rules currently, unfortunately. And that's exactly one of the things that, for example, IPAM and many other regulatory bodies can contribute to. Oh. So, oh, oh, oh. I was interested in automat when I looked into this for the uh, possibility of using it to uh, predict mm -hmm. for future uh, you're talking about shaped radiation fields. So the dis it becomes a decision about whether to trust the technology and how far you would go with supplying uh, raw data or using the algorithm. So. As, as with any model, it needs to be validated on appropriate holdout, appropriately sized data set, and appropriately powered data. Uh, if you do that, these models tend to work better than many of the classical models. So I wouldn't trust a classical model more just because I can explicitly see a short equation that is solved for. I would just use data as the evidence to demonstrate what works best and what doesn't. So in that specific application, I would just literally test what the performance of the algorithm is on a substantially large data set, and if the performance holds up and is better than any other technology you have, then that is empirically the best solution, and that's the one you should go for. I think there was one more at the back. I don't know if we have time. Is there another one? There was one at the back, but maybe not. Yeah, just at the very network, back. the same image, 100 times. Yeah. But it always comes to the same conclusion. Uh, most networks would come up with the same conclusion. Some networks have what is called a dropout layer, which is a way to introduce stochasticity in the predictions. But the reason we do that is not because we want the, the network to give us a different answer. It's because we want to exploit the different answers to understand how certain or uncertain the network is about the prediction it makes. So sometimes we want to give these stochastic networks multiple, the same image multiple times, see the distribution of predictions, and then use the distribution of predictions as, a, as an assessment of the uncertainty or certainty of these networks. But this is done on purpose, not because they is a is a inherently bad behavior. It's just something we want to exploit for the benefits of clinical safety. Thank you very much, George. We, we better move on in the interest of time. Thank you for your talk. Um, so it's my next job now to introduce our third speaker this evening, Dr. James Tio, who is the clinical director of data sciences and also a consultant neu uh, neurologist at King's College Hospital where he leads the KCH site within the London Medical Imaging and AI Centre for Value-Based Healthcare. So this um, he's worked with work Cogstack, well. which was introduced in our previous talk and is a, uh, an NLP-based clinical data analytics platform. Uh, and that work has shown how interoperable clinical data can be used uh, for real-world care, clinical research, operational efficiency, and AI development. And it's been adopted uh, as an NHS X AI flagship case. Uh, so over to you, James. Thank you very much, Rob. Very. So this, uh, a lot of this work is uh, based at King's College Hospital in the South London Maudsley NHS Foundation Trust, which is just about a mile south of here. Uh, and we're part of this, uh, ex this uh, King's Health Partners, which is an AI centre. So I'm going to be talking really on the 
uh, on, on Georgia's slide, the far left of it, the data end of it, uh, that, that the, the that computer is trying to swallow into their big uh, algorithm. So the data end of it in health data is not uh, is not as straightforward as pictures, unfortunately. So uh, mo in most healthcare, data is kept in little structured uh, ontologies. So ba basically little tables, they're kept in little classifiers, they're little encyclopedias, they're, little, uh, they're, they're essentially coded and structured and neatly arranged by people. Okay? And that's how we normally teach these algorithms right now when we curate this data. However, in the real world, large amounts of data is actually what we call unstructured. They're in all sorts of formats. They're in some, some of it's in text, some of it's in, in uh, various kinds of uh, uh, digital formats, as well as a variety of different completely un unclean formats. And most of the reason, the reason why a lot of this is unclean is because they, a lot of these systems did not uh, develop through design. We plugged something in because we needed it. And then someone else bought something else and they plugged something in and they, because they needed it. And they, they don't necessarily talk to each other. And so that issue, as a result, has resulted in a huge mess. And this is only going to increase. So this is an excellent diagram from uh, JAMA in the US in 2014, which just tries to give an idea where all the different kinds of data about someone's health might be. So the blue bits are on the bits in the hospital. So, and on this side, there's the structured data, all the stuff which is automatically cleaned, uh, usually acquired by machines or, 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 or with a bit of translation by humans, and all this unstructured stuff. And most of this unstructured stuff is actually written text because uh, human beings like communicate in text and language. Uh, and obviously, there's lots of other stuff as well which exists outside of the blue bits. Uh, and this, uh, we don't know what to do with this yet all those Facebook posts, all those tweets, all, uh, all those bits, but all that is often captured in language. And in this time, we've become used to generating text in digital format. So the problem with unstructured data is, is, is that, well, the main advantage really is that it's easy for humans to input. We like inputting unstructured data. Uh, and it's easy for humans to read, generally. Uh, and it's contained, but it's contained in all sorts of things, and it's fairly agnostic because it, it, the format of it depends on the writer. The writer decides the format. Uh, and, but as a result, it's very, very real time and it generates a large amount of information. And it's unfortunately how clinicians communicate with each other, nurses communicate with each other, healthcare professionals communicate with each other. So you would get a scenario like this in which there's a little bit of text. This is obviously a fictional bit of text in which you have all kinds of the problems of text which is all the spelling, typo, nomenclature, acronyms, negative terms, as in this person does not have, the family history terms this person's mother-in-law had. You, you get all kinds of scenarios. And this is the problem of language. And this is a problem which uh, pe people have tried to solve before outside of healthcare. So the problem is that there's too much healthcare, that health data is all over the place, with lots of little, little systems, and it's unstructured. And often it's stored in a format which is inflexible because we do not have a good healthcare uh, global standard, unlike other industries. And as a result, we, just, this is just an example of the health databases that exist in KCH. There's, there's, there, uh, these, there's a little database here for dealing with appointments. There's a little database here for, for, for a and &E. This is for, for the pathology systems. There's a, a, there's a health record bit, which is supposed to be the center of everything. Uh, the ITU bit, there's a, there's a, there's a, a surgical theater, there's this. And there are, there's probably another 200 up there, which we don't know about. <laughs> okay. And some of it is it, it, all kinds of very f nice formats like SQL, Microsoft Access, and obviously everyone's favorite, database format, Excel. Okay, and so and, and this is because, as I said, people just plug this in as they acquire new information. But all this data is what is needed to generate a health a AI, okay, and to find uh, find uh, features. So what we, uh, together with Richard Dobson and the Monsley, uh, worked on was trying to find search. So this was just a, maybe a week ago. Google Health has discovered that they should do search. <laughs> okay, all right, I mean, it's nice that they're joining us late in the party, but uh, they are actually very good in search, as I'm sure some of you have heard of. But uh, essentially, search is, is the issue because we have so much data. 
and the data is not clean. And they, Google has solved this problem for uh, outside of healthcare because they realized back in, back in the, 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 the early 90s and early 2000s is that most data that is being generated on the internet, no, no, they, they have no control over it. So they have to have an algorithmic way to search for it. So our solution uh, with the Monsey is to build a, a, a process to suck up all the unstructured and structured data from a variety of different databases and put it into a, a, an open source a searchable format uh, within the hospital. And uh, to allow our doctors and clinicians and nurses to find information about their patients. Now, tradition before this, if I wanted to find information, how many patients with uh, with a cough and a flu and lived in SW7 and uh, a ha with a dog showed up in a and &E, uh, in the last year. I pr even if I could find that, it would probably have taken me a year or two to find it, at the, even if I could find it. Okay? Uh, we, this takes seconds now. And so we've essentially Googleized our hospital's record for our own internal use. And so what this has therefore allowed us to do then we've realized is that suddenly we've got so much data that we can find, then we can start actually analyzing it and structuring it. So the, that, that step uh, in the arrow in, in, in George's diagram, which are moving from, da from data to features. So features. Features are essentially a slightly more structured forms of data. So if, if you search Google and it asks you, uh, you type in where does Homer Simpson work, it will tell you where Homer Simpson worked. Uh, it will say, but no, I would hope not, no, no one in Google had specifically programmed that specific question. Uh, if you, because in uh, the, uh, uh, the mid-2000s, Google moved to a semantic searching approach in which they tried to create a taxonomy of entities and where they exist, who, who relates to what, and so that uh, there is a, a map of knowledge. This map of knowledge is what uh, makes things work. So the meaning of a word is its use in language. This is a, a very uh, uh, important statement which, uh, it, to understand how a computer understands language right now. It understands language not by, the, the, uh, uh, by a complex rules-based approaches, these expert-written rules, but by its statistical associations with all the words around it. So how you use the word is how the computer understands you, okay? And if you give it enough words, it will learn how to understand you. That probably is a bit similar to how uh, little babies learn because you need to talk to them for them to learn. So our approach is we use a similar approach to a deep learning network, uh, which is a fairly recent one called BERT, which was only released last year. Uh, the pace of progress is such that these deep learning language networks, a new one comes out every, every three or four months, which is even faster than the previous one. So if you look at the phrase up there, during the night, HR was in the 40s to 50s, the patient was at, was at 8 milligrams slash HR. The HR in that and the HR in that is, if you, in ASCII terms, is identical. But they, the, the algorithm can distinguish between that HR is a stands for heart rate, a particular concept, and that HR, which is a particular concept, hour. And it learns that it's because if you just throw in millions and millions of documents of text, then it will learn that uh, if you phrase it in a certain way, that the HR means one thing in one context and one thing in the other. And so what we can start to do is we can develop algorithms which can learn what, how doctors write, which, as you can imagine, is not an easy task. Uh, well, other things you can also do is you can look for clusters of phrases which mean the same thing and unknown associations. So, for example, we look for the phrase kidney failure and we found all the various words associated with kidney failure, uh, the closest terms associated. And you can see that there. Paracetamol, all the painkillers that are appearing up together and uh, another uh, a painkiller, a nerve painkiller, various other painkillers got showed up, but you also see certain antipsychotics start showing up within it. And you, can, you start to build these statistical relationships mm -hmm. just by throwing large amounts of data. We have, so to, if you want to try to estimate how much data we've got, we, to be fair, most hospitals don't know. It's very hard to estimate, but base, for, once we've managed to search it, we've discovered we've got about three and a half billion documents. Uh, and that's just for, you know, bit of South London. 
And I'm sure every hospital has that. It's just they cannot f f access this information because there's so much. And we've got it over 20 years of doctors' ramblings, nurses' ramblings, and obviously some of it is fairly structured as well. So what we're reaching in the scenario is that we, we are able to take a bit of text, transform it into, uh, into to fit it within some sort of understanding of ontology, and we've created some, we, we tested it out in a semantic EHR approach in which we search for the meaning of the word rather than the word. So obviously everyone can search for a word, uh, like you know you just you just search for a keyword in a document, but this is searching for the meaning of the word. So certain words have certain meanings, which often have lots of synonyms. So we used it with it for a hundred k genome project, uh, and we were one of the few centers who were able to over recruit and also classify all these patients because we did it algorithmically rather than hiring a bunch of medical students to do it manually, which was the traditional approach. <laughs> uh, and so. Once we built that, then we realized we could use it for all sorts of things. So this was, was an audit in which we tried to track. Uh, we, we used an algorithm to read the text of, of drugs uh, we being used to treat uh, stroke patients, what we call anticoagulation. And as you can see here, the blue drug is warfarin, which is a blood thinner, which, is, which was the only thing in the market before 2012. And then a new drug started coming in, and you can see then spread it. And we can, we can audit this uh, automatically. And this took us. Uh, me and our cardiologists and Dan, a data scientist, about three months to do to build a pipeline and to do a bit of validation. This is uh, the Pinnacle Registry from the US. Uh, it took them 10 years to generate, uh, obviously a lot, much larger data set, but uh, manually collected by humans. Now this is a really boring task. <laughs> okay, <laughs> we don't, we shouldn't be giving humans these such boring tasks. And so, uh, and we can do this on the fly now. So we should be creating, at this stage, we're creating algorithms to re reduce the really boring tasks, the, the part tasks that we shouldn't be wasting humans on. Okay? Uh, obviously, at some stage, we'll be moving to superhuman performance, as we have seen before, and all the other things. But I think at this stage, what we, we'll, our primary focus, which is what uh, in, interests uh, NHSX and other organizations right now, is to reduce the amount of very inefficient, boring tasks that humans are being made to do. So other things we also did, we, we could classify all the different, the bleeding because we have this knowledge network so we can, as you know, with the word bleeding, there are lots of synonyms. Synonyms mean words, which two words mean the same thing. So that you can describe it as bleeding, hemorrhage, hemorrhage spot like an American, and all the other uh, phrases that doctors use. And because of that, it's often actually very hard to track how much bleeding is occurring in a hospital because they show up in all sorts of places and people call them all sorts of things. Uh, and, but we were able to track that. Uh, we can track, we can, uh, from that, that data about how much bleeding and how much people are being given blood thinners, we can plot out uh, the dimensional charts for each patient to see how many of them have, uh, have bleeding events uh, as it occurs. And the dark spots, are the areas where patients are at high risk, uh, that should be treated with, with blood thinners and the ones lower down should, should not be. And these are, these are standard clinical procedures. Uh, and we, and uh, these are just to see, show again the, how patients are moving from drugs to drugs, and we can do this on the fly, which, as I say, would have taken us years and, and you know, whole departments of PhD students to collect this kind of data. And moving on, we've also moved on to data which is neatly collected, what we call structured data. So data which is neatly collected uh, are usually neatly collected because the NHS requires us to neatly collect it, uh, because we are paid based on it. So one of the neatly collected things is a &E workloads, waiting times. So waiting times, how many patients uh, are seen within four hours in a &E, and you can see it's been declining over the years. Uh, and we've been, we, we, that data is collected, and we, we, we can plot it out here. This is one hospital, the Princess Royal, which is in further South London, in suburban South London. And this is uh, King's College Hospital up there. And we, we plot it out every day over a period uh, about three or four years ago. And you can see that you, you get these cycles in winter. But what was interesting was that we were interested in modeling this so that we could forecast this. Now, contrary to what people think, is not the volume of patients showing up in A&E which really causes uh, problems with flow. It's a, if, you, if, you know, if you imagine a pipe in the system, it's, not, it's either the problem upstream or downstream. And it's a problem downstream. It's because we cannot move the patients out of the hospital. And so we, we needed to build a system which can track this 
and track out what, what are the problems of flow within the hospital. You would have thought this would be remarkably simple, but there are lots of nurses and uh, doctors and administrators who run around with clipboards collecting this. Okay, and this is a manual process in many hospitals. So we built a graph system of every single ward. Uh, this, the green one is King's Lodge Hospital, the blue one is Princess Royal, and the direction of patients flow moving across the network. Uh, we've published this, uh, and basically each line is a patient moving from one ward to another. Uh, this is over like a two-year period. You can plot it on the graph. If anything, most of you will, who may know about graph networks, you can obviously do all kinds of modeling with this. Uh, this process of collecting it uh, was, uh, is surprisingly simple, but it's not done. It's actually done manually. Uh, it's, but it's actually recorded by metadata as patients are admitted and discharged. It's just that uh, uh, a lot of clinical staff time, administrative staff time is being spent just dragging this out. And th these things have been, you know, as we said, has been solved in other industries. And what we then did is then we plotted uh, so the, each second here is a patient moving from the a &E in the middle to uh, every second an hour and which ward they go to and each ward's expanding and such. The, hospitals don't actually know, easily know, how many patients are in and where they are. It's very hard to tell because most of it is manually collected and you need to build systems to automatically generate this. And this here is which wards are associated with good patient flow the next day. So this is on the same day, prediction, and the next day. And so we can see that which certain wards are critical to, to, to the flow in the hospital and certain wards are bottlenecks. Uh, and we can then, therefore, from there, build forecasting systems. We can forecast how likely an a and &E is going to be, become uh, overwhelmed. It's not overwhelmed because of the number of patients. We, we, we have lots of data which shows that, and NHS England has lots of data that shows that. It's not the volume of patients that are coming in, it's the volume of patients going out. And that is, uh, and so then we can we build these various things which measure how the network changes over the weekend, what, what, what features within the, the network are associated with uh, poor performance uh, within hospitals. So, so, but this is just to show you what can be done if we have enough real-time data. And it's not just about the data, it's about the real-timeness and that it has to be, it has to be, have some process to clean it rather than using humans. Obviously, we can use humans, but that's a very laborious process. Uh, and so, yes, so basically, yeah, so basically, the idea really is to use NLP, really, because that's the most natural format for humans to communicate. And it's quite likely, while humans still deliver a lot of healthcare, that uh, we, most information will be stored in data, in, in, in textual data, because while well, there will be, at some point, something which will be generated for a human to read. And a human, as so you know, humans do not like to input forms. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, James. So, um, fascinating talk. Thank you. Are, are there any uh, quick questions from the audience? Then we're going to move into the final panel session after that. But let's take a couple of questions for James's presentation. Completely bold the moment. Oh, in red here. How, how accurate is the, um, the thing you showed with the uh, automatic classification and structured text? So uh, at this stage, that this process is uh, at, the, at this stage, we need a, a manual validation step. The, uh, the volume, uh, the, the issue at the moment is that uh, we need enough humans to validate it. Once it's validated, then uh, we can progress r rapidly towards the deployment. Uh, we would say, say that on first. And without any training, the accuracy was about only 65%. Then with addition, with, within a training of about three hours, we got it to about 90% uh, for a particular one problem. But obviously, we need to test generalizability and such. But it's just amazing the pace of uh, natural language processing over the last few years. And just, just one thing. Similar to the question of quality earlier, mm. I've had to work on a database and one of the problems was the quality of the data, trying to screen it for mm. manual errors. Mm. How much of that is going to be a problem in... Almost certainly. Almost certainly. So at, at this stage, we need to, uh, at this stage, all, all I'm trying to do at the moment is, uh, is actually to uh, use humans to, uh, to verify the data and tr while verifying the data, generate an algorithm. This verification process is teaching the algorithm. 
uh, obviously at some stage there will be missingness of data, there will be uh, errors in the data, and so we will have to build systems which, which, which can detect that. Uh, we're not even at that, bed. we're at the foothills really. I mean, other industries are dealing with much more complex issues. In, in healthcare, the data is just an absolute mess. And so we, we can just use the, the simple solutions that other industries have used. Uh, at this stage, there are, there are prob there's 40 people in the hospital whose entire job is to read the text and to work out whether or not to charge someone for it, to charge, how much to charge NHS. This job can, should be sped up by these sort of systems. They need to read it and they spend 20 minutes reading every single record. Uh, extremely time wasting. And obviously that, that validation step will then teach the algorithm. <coughs> Thank you very much again, James. Um, so we're going to move into the panel discussion. Now. I sometimes hear people saying, well, you know, AI is going to replace radiologists and we won't, you know, that, that growth in the number of radiologists we need, well, we, we won't need any radiologists at all because AI will do it all. Um, so the first question then is, in, in the light of, of that sort of, uh, those sorts of comments and the realities of what AI is going to do in imaging, how will clinical imaging embrace AI? So we've carefully positioned you there, so you're the only people in the room who can't see the questions that we're asking you to address. <laughs> so it's very clever. Uh, so how will clinical imaging embrace AI? Who, who wants to kick off? <laughs> um, as a clinician, I guess I'm obliged to this one. Um, I, I, I think the real advantage of clinical imaging is that it would be Clinicians would embrace it if it takes the volume of workload away. Uh, we are inherently lazy creatures. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, there is more than enough work to be done at this stage. Uh, so I, I'm not sure if it uh, is an antagonistic position, but however, at the same time, there's, going to, there's almost certainly, there is going to be need for humans in the process. Obviously, in the initial stages, in the validation, in subsequently supervising the algorithms and using the appropriate one, it is not generalizable enough. And being aware, just like doctors are aware of a particular drug having you know, its, its advantages and its weak points, it's likely that most algorithms will have about strengths and weak points. And so it may be that uh, clinical imaging uh, specialists may end up becoming experts in algorithms. <laughs> the, um, the other point is that computers are, are very good at, at quantification um, and it can be very difficult for humans to actually produce an accurate quantification. So I think you know, that, that human sort of AI symbiosis is, is a very powerful sort of argument here because um, you know, providing empirical data can make a real difference to things like you know, sort of cancer staging or, or whatever it might be. So. Um, I think that, that you know, sort of relationship is, is, is one that we can exploit very well in medical imaging. Yeah, but just to, just to complete that answer, I think it also depends quite heavily on what time frame we're looking at it for. So if we're looking into 20, 30, 50, 100 years in the future, in 100 years from now, very likely the answer is yes, that's fine, that's probably the same for many other jobs. But there's a very slow process to get there. Algorithms are currently, most of the algorithms are currently not safe, and there's a process of trust that needs to be built throughout years of integration of working with each other. And that process needs to happen, and only when that process is complete can we then start trusting algorithms to treat humans directly. And we're not anywhere close to that. Thank you. Well, that, that issue about um, safety leads very nicely on to uh, the second question, uh, which is about AI safety in clinical settings. Um, what issues should be addressed? Panel. So I think one thing which I've been sort of thinking, pondering on for quite a while is that when I put up that picture before about sort of inference and training, it was a nice sort of transition, like you just move straight from training our algorithm to going into the clinic. And of course, that is never going to be true. And I think one of the points that George made is before is about this kind of empirical evidence that needs to be accumulated. And I think the missing piece in a lot of the kind of you know, infrastructure and platforms at the moment is this, you know, statistical information gathering about algorithmic performance. So that you know algorithms can run in the background um, on, on real data for a while and only actually sort of be elevated to the position of <coughs> possibility by clinicians when they have been demonstrated to be 
you know, at least as safe as whatever the, the baseline is. Um, and as, as you say, it's, uh, an element of it is this trust. And tr uh, even if the safety is, you know, pretty good, if there's no trust, then things will fall apart and people will not use it. So to build the trust, then you need uh, a key bit of it is to explainability to a certain degree and uh, keeping, initially at least, humans in the loop to supervise it, who can, superhumans who understand the algorithm. And I, I guess I'm, I'm kind of liking a lot of these discussions, but uh, the other part that I think is really important in healthcare is that healthcare is not, we're not in the same situation as, for example, self-driving cars. If you're in a self-driving car and the algorithm makes a wrong decision, you crash and you probably die. In the healthcare system, if the algorithm knows he's going to make the wrong decision, and we can teach these algorithms to know when they're making these wrong decisions, they can call a human. And it's perfectly fine to do that in the healthcare setting. So we just need to make sure these algorithms are designed and integrated in an appropriate way within the healthcare system in order for them to be safe. Thank you. Okay. Um, so here's a, 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 again a question that we've touched on a little bit in the discussion already. Um, but, but quite a big question that I suppose members of the public might be thinking when they see some of the, the, the hype that we see about medical AI in, in, in the media. Uh, and it's this, will I continue to be cared for by doctors or will AI take over? Where are we going to be in, again it probably depends on the time scale, but, but what do you think, Pam? <coughs> Well, uh, it's, that's a very interesting question. I don't think there's any danger of any kind of short-term uh, robots uh, <laughs> taking care of. But having said that, um, I did read an article recently about, um, I know in Japan that they've been using robots to sort of um, not take care of, but to uh, sort of provide some companionship for all the members <laughs> of the population. And apparently some of them, um, when the robot reaches the end of its battery or life or whatever, they get very upset about it. And, uh, so it appears that robots um, you know, can already uh, ingratiate themselves to, to some people, to the extent that they actually have funerals for them. <laughs> Uh, no, but, uh, I think the key word in this question is care for. Because you're not asking whether the robot will treat you. Okay? I think it's whether, whether it is, uh, uh, you will be cared for. And that's what humans <coughs> want. They want someone to care for them. They, they, may have, they, may, they may have a robot to do that operation or aspects of the operation, but they want a human to be caring for them. And that's the, the human element of it. Which you, the trust element is that, and then it's the human companionship, the human factors. And so I think empathy uh, and uh, the human aspects of clinical care will actually be re restored by this process. Um, and just to maybe add just a tiny little bit on top of, um, there are already some examples of humans being cared for 100% by algorithms. For example, there's very remote villages in China that have these places where you go into this little box and they ask you a bunch of questions and they take a couple of pictures from you. They try to come up with some solution in order to be able to treat you. And the reason that this exists is because there's absolutely no doctors there. So it's better to have that than having nothing. And if you now think about algorithms as companions, it all depends on which process of the healthcare escalation you are in. Obviously, if you're going to be in the center of London, you have enough specialists around you to be able to treat you in an appropriate way. But they're in a place that is not necessarily as, um, as, as, as privileged as London when it comes to access to care. Maybe algorithms perform extremely well. So I think it's also a balance that we need to have between technology performing really <coughs> better and uh, the privileged position that we are in by being in central London and, and, and having some sort of balance between those two that maximizes the quality of care that we can provide to patients. That's the ultimate goal, to make sure that can save lives. Thank you. Well, so that touched quite nicely on the sort of broader societal implications of AI, which, which we already heard aspects of in some of the talks. And so um, moves very nicely into the, the final question, which actually is posed in, in two slightly different ways. It's not really the same question. Should, stroke, will, society, more generally, I take that to mean not just healthcare, but society generally, embrace a HI? Will, will we come to love HI? Uh, HI? AI. <laughs> Uh, there is this really interesting uh, YouTube video called Humans Do Not Apply. 
uh, which is really about <laughs> is a very is, is, is very very informative and, and it's really about how every single area of every single job out there, all the way from very standardized professions to very creative professions, and how they will all be altered by AI, and many many all, all of them will be replaced by AI, by AI. And I think there is a societal process that needs to a societal discussion that needs to happen in terms of how we want this to perceive. Algorithms are not going to replace you because they want to replace you. They're going to be replacing you because we want them to replace us. Because we believe that that's the best way forward. And as a society, we need to be discussing what the impacts of those things are and how to make those decisions and how to introduce them slowly within our societies to make sure that our population is prepared and is not going to resent that change. I, I think we will, almost certainly. I think society will embrace it, but it will take Yes, Joshi. Yes, uh, this is not a conversation that will end in an evening or a year. This will be a process which happens over decades. Um, the industrial revolution was over a very long period. This is not going to happen in one hour generation. This will be multiple generations learning to embrace AI. Yes, I would also make the point that I think unwittingly. People probably already have embraced AI in many respects. So, you know, just things as simple as, like, say, so your iPhone is using AI the whole time, and we're all kind of benefiting from whatever device you might have. We're all benefiting from that, you know, without realizing that there's AI involved. I mean, things as simple as, you know, Netflix recommendations, these are all AI algorithms that are, that are running. So, I think, you know, possibly what, what we mean by AI can be sort of taken in a different direction. But, I would say we've all much already embraced it. Thank you very much. Well, well thanks very much for, for engaging with that um, discussion and for your talks earlier. Um, it just remains for me now to hand over to uh, Professor Stephen O'Connor, the President of IFM, who's going to just make some closing uh, remarks to end off this part of the evening. Not the whole evening, we've still got the reception to go. Thank you very much. <coughs> so. Uh, a few thank yous are uh, due, really. We'd like to thank um, all the speakers for giving of their time so generously and giving us these fascinating insights into AI, and I think we should give them a good round of applause for that. <laughs> I, uh, I should thank my co-conspirators, Steve Keeble and Seb Orslin, for uh, working with me to bring this uh, meeting to life tonight, um, and it's been very nice to see so many people coming along. Um, and that's warming for us to move on to uh, another one, um, so I'll come on to that. Um, Joanna and uh, Stamatina and Candy have done the logistics for us. Tom's done the filming, thank you very much. <coughs> and you, the audience, thank you for coming along. It's a pretty miserable evening outside here, isn't it? <laughs> Walking over Waterloo Bridge, it would have been easier if we'd been a book house or Kings on the Strand. Um, the reason I bought the tote bag up here is <coughs> this isn't just a cover to stop your wet clothes going, uh, getting onto the seats. There is a feedback form in here and some literature about IPEM and some, some uh, literature from Kings. Please could you fill out the feedback forms, um, preferably today. If you want to leave them on your chair or you leave them on the, the desks up at the back, we'd be very grateful. <coughs> this is the first of two events that we have a memorandum of understanding between IPEM and Kings. And we'd be very interested in the questions on the feedback form in what you would like to hear as the, the hot topic for the next meeting. So any ideas, please jot those down on your feedback form. <coughs> so um, the final thing is um, please to join us at the reception over the road at the uh, Franklin Wilkins building on the first floor. To, to gain access, you'll need your green sticker. Otherwise, if you haven't got it, you've lost it like I have, um, just hang around at reception and Joanna will, um, will sort it out. Thank you very much indeed. <coughs>